think we're going to make a start. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name's Alison Parr, and I'm from the West Midlands Whole School Send team. And I'm joined today by Conrad Bourne and Dawn Cranshaw, who's also in the team. And Whole School Send West Midlands are absolutely delighted to be presenting today with two members of the Midlands Partnership NHS Foundation Trust, Victoria Bailey and Sarah Jimenez Nervea. Both Victoria and Sarah are speech and language therapists working in Stoke-on-Trent, where in 2004, an initiative was set up to tackle the issue around the growing number of young children who were starting school with poor communication skills. And so um, a project called Stoke Speaks Out was born. This project has been hugely successful in the local area and we're delighted that today Sarah and Victoria are able to bring their learning from the project to a much wider audience. So I'm going to hand over to them and I hope that you get a lot out of this afternoon's session. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm just going to start by um, looking at uh, the aims for today. This first uh, session is the first of three where we're going to introduce communication um, and some strategies and difficulties children might have that you may encounter. The second session um, is going to be a bit more about identifying tools to identify children's uh, communication difficulties and then our third session will go into a bit more depth around strategies that you can use to support children with speech language and communication needs. And then our aim for today, um, as I say, to increase your awareness of the impact of speech language and communication difficulties on children and young people and emphasise the importance of oracy for lifelong learning. We're going to share with you some key definitions of the building blocks that make up communication skills and introduce um, the issues that children with SLCN may encounter in school. And as I say, start to introduce some general strategies today, um, but then they'll be gone into in more depth in future sessions. So to start with, we'd like to share some of the main research headlines around speech, language and communication needs, um, often abbreviated to SLCN. Um, SLCN is the most common developmental difficulty you are likely to encounter. More than 10% of children and young people nationally have a long term speech, language and communication need, which creates barriers to communication or learning in everyday life. And we can delve a bit deeper into that, that 10 percent. Um, and we know that 7.6 percent of children have something called developmental language disorder, um, again, abbreviated to DLD. This is where children have a difficulty acquiring language and have a disordered pattern of language development, but it's not due to any other condition they may have. It's simply a disorder in of itself. And those children um, are most likely to need speech and language therapy input at some point during their lives. And then we also have around 2.3% that have language disorders that are associated with other conditions such as autism or hearing impairment. So that's where that communication difficulty is coming alongside um, those other conditions that a child may have been diagnosed with. SLCN as an umbrella term also includes conditions such as speech difficulties. So this is where children will struggle with the pronunciation of their words. They might say the wrong sounds in words or miss sounds out and um, it can make children's speech tricky to understand and at worst make them really unintelligible. And again, that's something that they might be just a bit delayed with, or it could be something where they have a really disordered pattern um, and, and it's really hard for people to understand what they're saying. And again, they're likely to need some speech and language therapy input. 
SLCM can also include stammering or stuttering as well. Um, and we, we also refer to it as disfluency. So those children uh, may also need speech and language therapy. And there are many other uh, conditions within that, that umbrella term of SLCN um, that I haven't got time to go into in too much detail today. We also know from the research, and there is a lot of research that supports this, that children living in areas of social disadvantage are at a much higher risk of SLCN, with around 50% of children starting school with delayed language and other identified speech, language and communication needs. So when you compare that to that 10% national figure, it's a huge difference and um, a big challenge that we face um, and you will face if you do work in an area where you have higher levels of social disadvantage. And as Alison said, it, it's something that um, we experience very much in Stoke-on-Trent, where Sarah and I um, are based. Um, and hence, Stoke Speaks Out was started to try and help to tackle some of the uh, causes of these children starting school with that delayed language. And lots of those children their delayed language, language isn't necessarily due to a diagnosed condition. It might be due to lack of opportunities and experiences in their early years. Speech, language and communication difficulties has um, a wide ranging impact. Um, and primarily the first thing you'll notice in school is the impact on children's learning. Um, children with poor language at age five are six times less likely to reach the expected standard in English by the time they reach the end of primary school at age 11. And then we also have research around maths in relation to this. Um, they are 11 times less likely to reach that expected standard in maths if they have got a language delay at five years. So sometimes people find that that's surprising that the math statistic is worse than the English statistic being as we're talking about language. Um, however, if we think about what's involved in maths, particularly as you move up through the primary years, there's a lot of concept knowledge and language that children need to understand. Maths isn't always presented as just a number sum. There's often a maths problem buried in a paragraph of language. And so children who struggle to unpick that language or don't understand that concept language really struggle to access and achieve in maths as well. So looking at the early years foundation stage, um, just 26% of young children with SLCN make expected academic progress in the early years, compared with 69% of all children. So those children are really finding it difficult, even at this early stage, to keep up with the expected progress compared to children who don't have a, an SLCN. And then if we look at through the primary years, just 15% of pupils with SLCN achieve the expected standard in reading, writing and maths by the end of their primary school years, compared to 61% of all pupils. So again, that's showing that they are falling behind because um, their, their speech, language and communication difficulty is making it harder for them to access um, the learning they need to achieve in those areas. And then when we look at how this is, impacts GCSEs, only just over 20% of pupils with SLCN gain a grade C or 4 um, or above in English and Maths at GCSE, compared with just over well, nearly 64% of all pupils. So again, that SLCN really having an impact on children's attainment all the way up through into the secondary years. And it doesn't just end with their learning. SLCN has a wider impact on the whole of children's lives and opportunities. So we know that 81% of children with emotional and behavioural disorders have unidentified language difficulties. And we know that young people who are referred to mental health services are also three times more likely to have a, an SLCN compared to those who haven't been referred to those services. So lots of research 
backs up this this fact. Um, lots of children with a communication difficulty do have um, struggle with their mental health and emotional well-being. Um, and some research has shown that young people feel themselves to be less popular, less liked than their peers when they have a communication difficulty. So really impacting on that self-esteem and mental health. We know that this impact goes on into adulthood and affects employment opportunities. So children with poor vocabulary skills are twice as likely to be unemployed by adulthood. And then all of this can accumulate and lead to this statistic as well, that 60% of young offenders have low language skills. So if they've struggled and with their emotional and behavioural difficulties, they've struggled with mental health, they've struggled to find employment, all of those things together are making them much more vulnerable to um, ending up in the, the justice system. And so we see this figure of over half of those young offenders having low language skills. And that makes it really challenging for them in that situation where by the time you're in the justice system, there's a lot of complex legal language being used and they find that really hard to access. So hopefully those statistics kind of already tell you a little bit about why communication is so important, but just to cover a little bit more of that here. It's really important to meet our needs in order to communicate our needs effectively to others. And any of you who've worked with children of any age who are struggling to get across what, what they're asking to you will, will know the impact that this can have on them if they're not able to communicate their needs or, or what they're feeling. It's really important for social interaction. So communication allows us to interact and form relationships with others. If we can communicate and we know the rules of interaction, the rules of conversation, we can have a more successful relationship with other people. But um, a communication difficulty can be a barrier to that. It's important for emotional development as well. Um, having the language of emotions, so knowing the, the labels for those emotions, those big feelings that you're having, are really, it's really important to be able to understand those emotions and to be able to regulate your emotions and also to be able to understand other people's emotions so that you can see how someone else might be feeling and why that might impact the way that they are reacting and to be able to have some empathy as well. It's really important for thinking skills too. So language and thinking are closely linked. Words are our representation of ideas, of people, of places and of events. And having language for these things helps us to think about them and to express them. Thinking skills like problem solving, planning, reasoning, justifying, all utilise these language skills. And certainly once children get a little bit older, these are things that we're expecting them to do as part of their school day, to be, um, to be able to explain and problem solve, to reason and justify and say why they think something. So their language skills are really important to help them to do that. Confidence and self-esteem. Um, I've already kind of mentioned that's really important. Language is really important for this and how um, children think of themselves as less clever and less popular if, if they have a language uh, communication difficulty. And for learning, of course, it's needed throughout the curriculum. Communication can be seen as the golden thread that runs through all subjects. So it doesn't matter whether it's maths, geography, science, English, any of those and all of those subjects are going to need language for the children to be able to access them. And finally, um, it's really important for literacy too. Children need to have a robust language system in order to then go on and develop literacy skills. The language skills underpin the skills for reading and writing. And we know that most children, um, the, the research kind of goes between 50 to 90 percent of children with persistent speech, language and communication difficulties will go on to have reading difficulties. So a really strong link there between having 
um, good oral skills to then be able to acquire successfully those literacy skills as well. So how do we acquire, um, what elements make up communication skills? Um, communication is multifaceted. It can be both verbal and nonverbal. So it, the verbal side to do with having the vocabulary, knowing how to put language together. And then the nonverbal side is about um, understanding and using facial expression, gesture and things like that. It relies on first having interaction and pre-verbal skills. So pre-verbal skills are being responsive, making eye contact, taking turns, reacting and initiating um, an interaction or a request with another person. It builds on listening and attention skills as well, um, on being able to follow direction from others, um, to be able to share interest and sh shared attention um, with another person. Um, it we need to understand as well before we are able to use language. So our, our being able to talk relies on that understanding being there first. And then, as I've said, oracy becomes before literacy. So we need those oral skills to be able to do the reading and the writing. And then there are higher language skills such as inference, sarcasm, humour and wit, and they all develop later on and again require that firm language foundation to be established in order to develop those higher language skills. So how do we acquire these? Lots of theories of language um, are around, but they all agree that the bedrock for this communication learning is secure attachment and responsive parenting. We're hardwired and born to communicate. Babies seek out face shapes and seek out interaction. And if a carer is responsive to their child, they learn that communication is successful, rewarding and useful to get their needs met, which reinforces that back and forth between child and adult. So how well this progresses depends on how much of that responsiveness we get and how um, nurturing the environment we're born into is. And 70% of our total brain development happens in the first three years of life, with 90% of that in the first year. So that just shows how crucial those really early years are. And so it's really important to influence parents and home learning environments for the children in our care. So just a brief statistic here around um, the effects of parents versus schools. And this is from some research by Saka from 2002, showing the degree of impact a parent has versus the quality of the school they're at. So you can see from these figures that the parents exert the majority of influence over their children's learning in the early years and the primary years. The balance shifts a bit by the time they get to secondary school, to more towards school. Um, but parents are a major, major influence in those early and primary years. And if we reflect on the lockdown periods that we've been through, every child's had a different experience, both good and bad. Some will have had little support and lots of distractions and varied access to the Internet. And these family and environmental factors will also greatly impact on their communication skills, too. So what can you do? Um, sorry looking at the next slide and um, specific difficulties so not all SLCN are related to parenting um, some children are born with medical and genetic conditions or acquire development developmental issues through injury and some may have a combination of both which can sometimes make it really tricky to unpick so we know that school practitioners and SENCOs need to feel confident in identifying when a child's not on track and where the breakdown occurs and know how to support next steps which is what this series of webinars is aiming to, to support you with. So how can we influence uh, communication more? We can involve parents and build those strong relationships with parents and provide a good communication model for children. We can fill in vocabulary gaps. 
children might pick up that specific vocabulary, what we call tier three words. So very specific to your curriculum very well when you teach it specifically, but they might have underlying gaps in tier one and two words to attach this new language to. So that's tier one and two are the words that you learn every day through generation. So if children have gaps there, it makes it harder to learn those more specific words. We can create opportunities throughout the day and across the curriculum for listening, understanding and talking and identify issues really early and seek support when needed. And we'll cover this more in depth in session two. So we want schools to be focusing on oracy across the school and ensure this is an ongoing priority on school development plans. OK. So I'm going to hand over to Sarah because she's going to take you in a little bit more detail through some of those building blocks of language that I've kind of briefly mentioned so far. OK, thank you, Victoria, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so like Victoria mentioned, um, there's some things that schools can put into place um, to support children with SLCN. And um, so really crucial and fundamental is that all practitioners have a sound knowledge of typical ages and stages in order to support and to identify children with an SLCN and, and make those decisions around their knowledge around how to seek further help. Um, we've got on screen there some useful links um, for professionals to kind of brush up on their ages and stages no, um, knowledge. The first one of those is um, what um, we've developed in Stoke-on-Trent, which is the Early Years Child Development Tool. Um, that can be found on our stokespeaks.org website um, and um, it's under the professionals area. So really strong you to ur urge you to look at that website for more information, particularly if you are practitioners in the early years. It's just been re um, revised. Um, to fit um, kind of with the new um, EYFS kind of framework as well. Um, and it's a really handy tool um, to be able to spot kind of the, the ages and stages. And it's actually broken down into really small age bands. And um, so um, the breadth of kind of really early stages, like the eight to 20 months, is actually this vast amount we would expect in a child's development between that point. So we've actually broken it down into really small chunks. Um, so um, really um, easy to spot kind of um, skills, if you like, really with children. So um, before kind of we, the, there can be some confusion with they're not doing this and they're expected to do that. And we've actually made it very easy to be able to tick, tick that off. So really um, encourage you to download that. There is also for older children, um, there's practitioners working kind of um, through um, secondary and um, the ICANN. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with ICANN, they are a communication charity. Um, so it's ICANN.org.uk um, and you will be able to see um, their ages and stages um, from birth to 17 as well. So uh, really, really useful um, tools to be able to, to access to support your decision making around um, these um, this children and young people. Um, as speech and language therapists, we usually work with children whose speech language and communication are out of sync with the rest of their development. So they're not um, progressing um, as they are uh, in line with their cognitive abilities um, or where they may be showing a disordered pattern. So um, like Victoria mentioned before, a disordered pattern is probably where there is much of a spiky profile. So there's some strengths in some areas, but not in others. Um, so as a profession, we tend to work with those groups of um, children. Okay, so going on to the next um, set of slides, um, Together, kind of with me and Victoria, we're going to um, take you through the building blocks for communication. And for those of you who are practitioners in secondary, um, these are skills that all children will need. Um, and I think you may find that useful to kind of think about, um, you know, not an age related stage, although we will go into some of those areas, but that kind of a, a series of blocks to communication. So we'll apply to really young children um, and kind of secondary age pupils as well. 
So the next few slides will explain some of the key building blocks um, to um, communication um, development that you might come across um, and some general strategies to support these in session three, which is the um, session that's going to take place on Thursday, the 9th of December, um, from four till five again, we will um, go into these strategies, how to um, embed these into the everyday kind of classroom activities. Um, so we'll go into that a little bit more detail, so we won't um, talk too much about it um, this afternoon. So the first building block are what we've got is those pre-verbal skills and Victoria has already mentioned kind of those pre-verbal skills but this kind of again is the bedrock of communication the foundation um to um to building kind of communication on so a really strong foundation so thinking about it as the kind of the, the footings in the house to be able to build on that, that solid that solid foundation so pre-verbal skills are um those skills that kind of that that early interaction um, and certainly kind of interaction skills in general that desiring to be with another person to be able to interact together um, and sometimes I think um, some of these things we might take for granted in typical development and it's not until we see maybe a child who is struggling with some of these areas that we we kind of notice that these things are are not there um, it's around seeking out communication for a reason. So it's being intentional. It's about seeking out another person to communicate to all those reasons that um, Victoria had mentioned in the, in the diagram before around um, getting your needs met or commenting on what is um, going on around you. It's that being responsive, that responsive to another adult and another person. It's about that making eye contact and looking at a person or a shared stimulus. So it's about sharing attention and kind of looking at something together to direct. So being together in, in an interaction. It's being able to share that activity or pay attention. to um, So seeking somebody's um, attention to kind of uh, direct it to kind of what um, a child wants them to. It's about taking turns. It's about that serve and return. And we talk about that serve and return in the early days and the kind of that foundation to supporting attachment in the early years. That kind of intention, um, non-intentional kind of coup from a baby or a smile that gets responded to. So with Victoria mentioning about um, kind of that, that responsiveness of an adult um, and picking up on those, um, those cues and it initiates that serve and return that maybe then baby might smile again and then again it initiates that that interaction and again that can happen in older children so it's not just those non-intentional smiles and in, in kind of um, in six weeks from birth but it can be that commenting from a child to an adult the adult responding then the child responding back um, in the early days that kind of serve and return with kind of the cooing and the, the smile responded to a smile is mimics that turn taking that we need in general kind of conversation that somebody somebody does something then somebody else does something it's about picking up on those non-verbal cues and reacting appropriately so not just reading and looking for the verbal but actually those non-verbal cues what are those facial expressions telling you what is the um um the pointing um and all those things kind of um helping you to 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 pick up on and what that, what's that message sending to you? It's about allowing others into your space. So from an early age, kind of does, um, do they want to um, kind of be cuddled, be held? Do they kind of respond to that positive touch? Or is it uh, with children when you are kind of playing alongside and they're tolerating you joining in with them or kind of getting closer to them? And do they, do they want you to share in that space? It's about understanding what age appropriate interactions are. So it's about understanding those rules of personal space, what the social norms are around, you know, where might, how close might you get to your friend or your family member versus maybe to a member of staff at school. So all those unwritten rules around kind of what's acceptable and what isn't. So difficulties you might encounter. So typically children with a developmental delay um, and a disorder may struggle with these pre-verbal skills. It might be that the child is saying lots of words, but actually they're really struggling to take turns, to give eye contact, to share attention. 
It may be um, as a result of a lack of stimulation, like Victoria mentioned before, that those um, nonverbal cues haven't been responded to. Um, so um, they haven't learnt that model of, well, if I do something, if I if I smile or if I look um, or if I point, um, it's not it's not worth doing that because it's not responded to. So they don't learn those rules. Um, and that might kind of fit in with that insecure attachment pattern. So for those children who haven't got that secure attachment and they haven't been responded to, um, then that um, and it doesn't and obviously that responsiveness supports the attachment. If a child has got insecure attachment, you may see difficulties with the pre-verbal skills. Also around um, perceptual defence. So that is where. Um, there has been a negative reaction to sound and it, sometimes it can be linked to kind of severe abuse or neglect. There's been lots of um, kind of noise um, and kind of in the environment and they've kind of the child has sort of chosen to, to not process that um, or address that um, in the way so it hasn't, they don't necessarily respond to um, kind of noises in the environment. It can also go along side with a sensory impairment. So that is where one of the senses is not working as it should. So that may be a hearing um, impairment. So it might not respond if they call their name. Um, it might look that there is a pre-verbal kind of those pre-verbal skills of kind of responding, responding to something and sharing that attention doesn't happen. It, there may also be a visual where with sensory impairment, where there's visual impairment and um, unable to read those facial expressions um, unable to kind of verbally turn take difficult to kind of pick up on other cues. And children who have um, an autistic spectrum disorder, so abbreviated to ASD, may also struggle with these pre-verbal pre skills, um, particularly around sharing attention. Um, they generally um, have a lack of kind of desire or kind of um, awareness that there there is that so those social skills to kind of put into place. So you may see quite often the pre-verbal skills um, affected in this group of children. Sarah, can we just ask a question? Virginia's put in the chat, cool. is the lack of eye contact on its own a concern? Um, it's really difficult to tell um, in terms of kind of, you might need to look at the general kind of holistic kind of um, information about the child in terms of what their other skills are. Um, sometimes a lack of eye contact can be associated with certain cultures who feel that it is uh, rude to kind of demonstrate too much um, eye contact. Um, sometimes it can be a, um, a kind of a, an avoidance mechanism of kind of one, well, you probably all do this as adults, don't we? Kind of if you, um, you know, avoid eye contact if you don't want to be asked a question or something like that, or um, be picked for something. Um, so um, it, it is very much dependent on um, kind of the, the, the rest of taking into account the rest of the child's skills, really. Um, and certainly, you know, we know that children, some children on the autistic spectrum really struggle with eye contact and certainly kind of it's, it, we need more information than, um, than maybe just the eye, um, just with eye contact. Victoria, did you want to add anything to that? No, I, th I think you've covered that, Sarah. I agree with what you say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, no, that's OK. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm sure we can be available at the end of the, the webinar today if you wanted to kind of give a little bit more information. Um, so kind of what we wanted to do with all areas of the, the building blocks for communication is kind of what might this look like for a child in your school? So how, how might this present? Um, and there's a little case study here um, around kind of a five year old child, Alfie. Um, so it's just giving you a little bit of information of kind of maybe thinking about some of these areas down the left hand side that may, may kind of be that kind of red flags for difficulties with pre-verbal skills. Um, so Alfie's five, he didn't attend a nursery, uh, he came in straight into reception. He'll not sit down with other children or in a group. He covers his ears when there are loud noises. He has no focus of attention. He'll flip from one activity to another, other than the whiteboard where he'll stand for quite a long time if he's not prompted to move. If adults try to direct him, he'll kick or run off. He repeats sentences he hears over and over but does not fully understand instructions or appear to understand. So he doesn't carry out instructions or appears to understand them. 
So what we might kind of um, kind of glean from this with Alfie is that there may be a lack of interaction, lack of interest in others. So the fact that he's got no kind of real focused attention, you'll not sit down with the rest of the children in his group. So that could kind of make you think that he's he's not got that kind of social interest. Um, there's some poor eye contact noted there. Um, so kind of again that will kind of might go with that focused attention um, and again with that kind of not really wanting to join in with the other children in the group um, and again if you try adults try to direct him to something he'll kind of kick or run off and um, he might not know how to interact or play with others and intolerant of others joining in so that kind of turn taking that kind of willingness to sort of follow an adult lead being quite self-directed um, in their kind of um, behavior um, might, he might dislike positive touch so kind of doesn't necessarily want to get close to people maybe in, suggest some kind of sensitivity to some noises if he's covering his ears um, he might be hyper alert and we tend to find this with some children um, where um, potentially can have an insecure attachment where they are kind of not going into too much detail in the brain development but they are kind of focused on their kind of primitive brain and that's the bit that kind of you know kind of keeps us going um, and that cortex that thinking brain can become disengaged so they're thinking ability um their ability to kind of put put their thinking into um, kind of to into action um kind of can can be difficult so they might be on the lookout to um kind of see if there is a kind of a, a an adult or adult around or always looking for the next thing um to do so kind of be hyper alert and try to find it quite difficult to to be directed to an activity um so you might need kind of strategies into in place which again we will cover in, in more detail on the ongoing uh, webinars you might get some challenging behavior particularly around wanting to follow an adult lead um, or disliking to follow an adult lead where you know they'll kind of you know explain um, display that challenging behavior to kind of let you know that no that's it no i'm not not happy and and obviously in this case with alfie he's kicking or he's running away you might get some withdrawal and avoidance so avoidance kind of wanting to be where other children are um, or um, kind of um, avoidance of certain situations because it seems as though he's quite interested in the whiteboard um, where potentially he's kind of alone perhaps um, so kind of avoiding kind of being in in kind of areas around other people where other children are potentially and um, i'm sure victoria in the next couple of when we talk about the building blocks will um look at um repeating sentences and about understanding so we'll look at that in a bit more detail in the next blocks okay so what can you do so being available um and modeling that positive interaction so um that sounds very simple doesn't it but and, and they're in a classroom full of 30 that's kind of really challenging but if a child hasn't had that kind of positive interaction model so if they point at something or if they give you eye contact and smile they haven't had that model that responded um, responsive adult and um, so being available being um being that person that, that the child can come to um, and not always um, being busy which i know is again it's easier said than done and um, recognizing all those attempts at interaction and responding positively providing lots of reasons and opportunities for children to interact with you so again i'm sure we'll look at this in much more detail in the next webinars but um sometimes in a day in a classroom their children don't always offer have to ask for things and um, because everything is sort of so routine um, you know they don't have to ask for a snack because it's always there or um, all the things that they want to play with or all the books that they need are there for them so um, the, there's reduced opportunities and, and quite often with teaching children to be more independent with activities actually we reduce the amount of opportunities for language and for asking for things um, obviously um, these examples here are kind of um, you know ranging in ages but introduce simple interaction and turn-taking games so even playing those early games of peekaboo ball rolling kind of turn-taking games kind of like snakes and ladders or kind of pop-up pirate or whatever are really useful um, to be able to kind of 
show how to take turns before children have to verbally take turns. Um, so sharing attention through books, um, copying faces, kind of it maintains those children's, children's interaction. Um, and obviously older board games and things that are a little bit more complicated um, for children to develop those skills. Um, following a child's lead, finding out what they're interested in. So for, for Alfie, is it that he's not interested in coming to sit down and kind of listening to a story because it's quite challenging for him? He's, it's not motivating. So finding out what children are motivated by, sometimes we do see that it, those pre verbal skills much more sustained um, when they are motivated by something. You might just want to generally sit next to them if they're not, certain, not necessarily letting you in. You might want to sit alongside um, and kind of gradually kind of join in with what they're doing. Providing visual cues and objects of reference are really good to support your verbal instruction. Um, quite often words have gone, you know, you, once you've said a sentence and instruction, it's gone. But using objects of reference and visual support, they are a much more permanent way of making kind of words stick. Um, older children might need that explicit teaching of social norms and appropriate interactions. So having group time, and again, I'm sure we'll look at this, but having group time around what makes a good listener, what makes a good talker, what, how do we take turns is really, really important. So the next kind of building block, if you like, is around play. Um, so um, play is innate. So like um, kind of children are born to be social beings. So those interaction skills are typically innate. Um, babies are born to seek out facial expressions um, and to be social. Um, play skills are exactly the same um, and they are innate and hardwired. So play is a way for children to learn about the world. Um, the opportunities for children to act out and practice new skills, um, particularly support language and interaction so um you know it's not just humans that kind of practice kind of um skills in play if you think about lion cubs that you see kind of like play fighting and um, they are practicing those skills that they will need for later life and so um so children do in in play as well they'll practice all those new things whether it be pretending to be a vet or a doctor or in the home corner and um, that it's really important to be able to practice out those skills um Play gives us an insight into children's readiness for language and communication. And the most crucial um, stage of um, play um, is what we call symbolism. And, and these are things that children will need to kind of go through. Um, even, you know, it's not something that if they're missing a stage of play out, that actually children do need to acquire these levels of play. Um, and symbolism is what kind of that typical play of children where they might classically pick up a banana and pretend it's a phone or they might put that fire, um, fireman's helmet on the head and um, sorry they put a saucepan on the head and pretend it's a fireman's helmet and um, that and that symbolism shows that children are ready for language because it, they're using something to stand for something else so the word cat for example is only kind of the, the sound at together it doesn't look anything like the word but it, that's a symbol. So words are symbols for things. So we know through play that children are, if they've got symbolic play, that they are ready for language development. So I'm not going to dwell on these age stages of play, but you can see play develops as children mature, right from that early play through to kind of um, more imaginary and fantasy play and cooperative play that's more rule based. So typically children kind of that symbolic play will kind of happen around eight to 12 months and around about five you start to see children have more rule based play. Um, so again children go through this and, and you can see that there's probably different varieties of language needed um, and the more the more sophisticated the play the more language is supported. The difficulties you might encounter, so you might have that that children haven't had an opportunity to play, so there's been a lack of appropriate toys and play experiences. They might have been too insecure to explore. So, um, what a secure attachment does it in, it kind of it it develops that that solid foundation and that security that the trusted adult will be there and they can go out and explore the world. Um, Developmental delays, so cognitively children are kind of at, at a certain level and, and not exploring and not demonstrating their play. 
that lack of role model kind of goes with the opportunity and hasn't always been maybe that demonstrated kind of how to play with toys um, and lack of social experiences um, and and they're probably more pertinent than ever now that kind of lack of groups to attend but that kind of social aspect of play and that lack of experiences of turn taking and sharing um, so you're not building up those skills. So what can you do? So you can ensure that, that there are eight adequate stage related toys. Um, don't always worry about the ages on the boxes. Obviously safety is paramount, but um, certainly things like tea sets can be three year old plus. So, um, you know, we would certainly want that pretend play and symbolic play with that to kind of happen at a much earlier age. Um, as with everything, get to know what your children, children like to play with, what they're motivated by and join in with their play and um, extending those opportunities and modeling new ways, offering choices, um, but not having too many toys out so that that kind of attention and listening isn't kind of focused. Um, don't rely on those bought toys, those all singing, all dancing kind of, um, you know, these messages you might want to share with parents around, you know, that kind of all singing, all dancing kind of tablet toy around kind of demonstrating phonics. You know, it's much better to have an adult to kind of support with that play. And, um, you know, kind of things like that are kind of, there's, a, there's only so much you can do with them, but play with an adult is much kind of open-ended. So, um, you know, kind of making sure that kind of parents play alongside and, and play with their children. Um, for older children, Lego therapy is really good um, about kind of learning about cooperative level of play and, um, you know, kind of somebody being the, the builder, somebody be the person who looks at the, the, the plan to see what toys, what blocks you need, the person kind of who then chooses what block and kind of all working together. Um, and barrier games, again, we'll look in this more detail, but we'll can support with that cooperative play um, and um, certainly help verbal communication um, around setting up a scene and asking somebody to, to kind of put the red block on the blue block um, and responding to instructions. Okay, so the next building block is that attention and listening building block. Um, and attention and listening again, children are born and we check whether children can hear, but attention and listening is actually an acquired skill. So it needs careful management of the environment at a really young age to be able to allow these skills to develop. Um, so it relies on tuning in to meaningful sounds. It means turning to the source of sounds, it means kind of selective attention to sounds. Now that's a really key milestone in development and it happens around eight months to one year where typically children, babies will turn to any noise, but from that period of time between eight months and one year, they actually focus on something that they want to focus on um, and sometimes things can get in the way of that and we'll look at that on the next slide. Um, attention listening involves sharing attention, shifting attention between different people or stimulus. So certainly by the time a child's at reception, we would be certainly in secondary school, we would be wanting them to be able to shift their attention between what they're doing to look at the adult or the teacher asking them a question and to be able to go back quite, quite easily. It's about sustaining interest and staying on task, so concentrating for a length of time. It's about being able to pay attention to the speaker without interrupting a task, so being able to shift that tension really smoothly. The next slide will kind of look at some age norms, so I'm not kind of going to go into that in detail because you've, uh, you'll have that for your um, records on the slides, just conscious of, of time. So what can impact on successful development? So lack of opportunities to develop these skills. So um, not having kind of that environment managed at a really young age, not having those opportunities to develop those attention and listening skills, the lack of models for good listening behaviors. So kind of, is it that, you know, as, as um, caregivers or as adults, we are actually modeling what kind of that good listening. So looking at somebody generally when, we, when we're talking to them that shows that we are listening. Children with a developmental delay and disorder may have um, difficulties in attention and listening. And certainly we see that lots in that we quite often we have to work on that level of um, that's that building block in order to, to successfully develop language skills. 
obviously it goes without saying kind of hearing impairment um, and children with autistic spectrum disorder and with an auditory processing disorder. So that's where there's no difficulty with hearing with auditory processing disorder. But what they, what children with um, APD struggle with is being able to kind of differentiate between sounds. So you might see that with children when they're writing, when they're writing certain different letters um, is maybe because their, their processing of what they're hearing is, is distorted. Um, environmental influences on attention and listening, so kind of things that kind of we need to manage to support children to develop it, um, the attention and listening skills is around reducing background noise. So we know classrooms can be really noisy. There's noise from the whiteboard. There's noise from kind of what's going on next door. Um, there's people chattering. Background noise is one of the most influential factors in terms of um, spotting if a child is at risk of language delay. So we give parents information around turning the TV off, not having the radio on. And um, so managing your environment so that it's not as noisy is really, really beneficial for children. Being close when talking as well. So you can pick up all on those nonverbal cues and not maybe shouting from kind of the other side of the room. Being face to face, having that shared knowledge and explain what you want clearly in simple terms and having um, physical distractions and visual distractions that can be um, kind of not just the auditory, but can be really distracting for children to reduce those as much as possible. And again, here's a sort of a list of things that you might be able to kind of do in games and things to support. Again, I won't go into to, to these because I'm again conscious of time, but you'll have these um, are available on your slides and I'm sure we'll, we'll revisit these again um, in the next couple of webinars. I think I'm handing back to you, Victoria, to take you through the last blocks of the pyramid. Of yep. Communication. Yep. That's right. Thank you, Sarah. We're nearly there up to the top of our, um, our building blocks now. So looking at understanding now, receptive language and comprehension are other terms that are used for understanding. Um, it's about the brain making sense of that information coming in. It relies on that being accurate. It links to a child's experiences. So if they've experienced lots of language and words and, and different things, then they'll have more of that language. Um, relies on those auditory and visual skills Sarah talked about. And it involves the meaning of words, sentences, concepts, grammar and higher level skills, which I think we have on this next slide. So understanding relies on all of these things. So vocabulary means the understanding of what words mean. Auditory memory means remembering that verbal information that you're being given. Information carrying words is about holding and processing a certain amount of information in your memory um, in order to then understand it immediately or follow the instruction. Grammar, so knowing that to talk about something that happened yesterday, we put an ED on the end of the word to make it into past tense, things like that. All those kind of rules of, of language and grammar are something children need to understand. And then I mentioned earlier, higher level skills are things like inferring information, reading between the lines, knowing, um, understanding humour and idioms, things like um, pull your socks up, knowing we don't literally mean that, knowing that it means something else. So all of these different areas all contribute together to being what children need to learn to understand. And again, we've given you some um, slides here with some milestones um, and what you should expect at different ages. So I'm not going to go through it in huge detail because um, you've got the slides to be able to read through that. Um, but it, go, it goes right from nine months to just understanding a few words all the way up to four years where they're, they're talking about um, the present, the future, categorising words, using questions. And then five to seven years, the use of language is getting more complex. Um, they're able to focus longer without being reminded. They're understanding descriptive words, very specific words like minus and take away and that they mean the same thing, even though they're different words. They'll be able to share and discuss more complex ideas and use that language in a range of social situations. And then on to seven to 11 years, 
that's just getting more complex. Um, they can predict, they can draw conclusions, they can understand comparatives, they can have a conversation and give reasons and explain choices and start conversations with people they don't know, have that sort of social confidence to do that. And understand passive sentences or sentences where the order of words can be confusing. By seven to 11 years, we're expecting them to be able to understand that. So you can find these um, norms in more detail on the slide that Sarah talked about with the links um, on to, to more detailed norms if you want to chase that up. So difficulties you may encounter. I've mentioned developmental language disorder. Um, it could be that disorder or delay, as I said before, related to another condition. It could be delayed communication as a part of a global developmental delay. Or it could be due to lack of exposure to words and language from poor models or um, limited life experiences. So case study B is Caris kind of just paints a picture of how this might present for a child. Always looking around the class classroom, not being able to independently get on with a task, answering the wrong question or going off at a tangent when asked a question. Having angry outbursts and lashing out for no reason, particularly for writing tasks. So maybe she finds those challenging and so distracts from them. Her reading and writing are delayed. We talked about the importance of oracy for literacy. She's chatty, but doesn't always make sense. So she's not always putting the right words together, using the right grammar and structuring her sentences properly. So it doesn't always make sense. So that might sound a bit familiar to some of you. You might know children who present in a similar way to Karis. So what can you do? Make sure they're listening before you talk to them. Sarah talked about the importance of attention and listening. So you need to get that attention first so they can understand to the best of their ability. Immerse them in good language models, but pitch it at the right level. If you know you've got a 12 year old, but you know that they're functioning more at an eight year old level, you need to talk to them like they're an eight year old to help them to understand. Introducing stories at the right level for the child so that it's not too complex, but it's stretching their vocabulary a little bit. Pre-teaching new vocabulary and labelling things in context so that you're building that vocabulary. Um, repeating the words and using those new words as part of your everyday routines. Support what you're saying with your gesture and facial expression. And you might want to use props, objects, visuals and demonstrations to support what you're saying. Reduce the number of words in what you're saying as well. Make that sentence more simple. Um, use the new word, but remind them what it means with a definition in simpler terms that they will understand. So all of these things can support um, children's understanding. For older children, they might need a variety of strategies to support their understanding, such as using gesture, drawings, prompt cards, photos, symbols, you could use a visual timetable, you could have vo vocabulary for that lesson, you could have visual or written down what the expected behaviour is, or the sequence of steps in an activity you're expecting them to do. Sit them near to you, encourage them to ask questions and seek clarification, and if they need a visual tool for this, like a traffic light system, then that might be useful. And ensuring everybody's using these strategies consistently across all subjects and they might need TA support to encourage that independent work. So bear in mind these strategies need to be stage appropriate regardless of the age or the school year that the child is in. So moving on to spoken language, it's kind of like the other side of the coin to understanding really. It relies again on having the right words and linking them in the right order and knowing the grammar and knowing the nonverbal cues and the conversation rules. So a child has to have all that in the understanding side to then be able to use it expressively. So we know that vocabulary is the key to language learning and is mainly determined um, before the age of seven by how much they're spoken to. So when the parents use more words, they acquire larger vocabularies, hence the importance of getting parents on board. There was a, a, a study that showed that a child from a, a deprived background hears three million words a year compared to um, 
a child from a professional family hears 11 million words a year. So a huge difference there. And this has an impact. Um, the size of the vocabulary at five is a strong predictor of how they're going to succeed in school. And it is that poor vocabulary is a primary cause of academic failure of disadvantaged students too. So pre-teaching vocabulary, boosting vocabulary is a really key thing you can do to support children's language. So we have the same risks and causes for spoken language as we have for understanding. So whether that's a disorder or a delay or it's part of another condition. So all the same kind of causes that we've talked about with understanding, really. You can have a spoken language difficulty without a problem in understanding or a child might struggle with both of those. So. Supporting spoken language, again, is a lot about modelling and explaining new vocabulary. This is something as with the strategies, we'll go into how to do this in more detail in our future webinars. Commenting and leaving pauses. So you are giving chance for the child to have that conversation. Repeating back what they say, but add a word or say it back correctly so they're getting a good model from you. Using open questions to give them opportunity to say more than just a yes, no offering choices because that gives them the language as well as giving them a chance to um, use your model to respond. Encouraging turn taking conversation, encouraging a love of reading because reading is going to expand their vocabulary too. And encouraging them to show you if you don't understand what they're saying. Don't just pretend you understand, help them to show you. So I'm just conscious of time. So I'm gonna whiz through this last building block um, on the the uh, building block of communication. So speech is about being able to articulate sounds clearly and is a complex uh, coordination of the muscles. This is kind of the ages and stages for speech sound development. So those of you teaching phonics might notice it doesn't exactly match up with the order that you do things in phonics. Um, we've got a, a copy of this on that professionals area of our website, stokespeaks.org, if you're interested in downloading these ages and stages and norms for speech. Um, but just being aware that it takes up to seven years in typical development for all the sounds to develop clearly. So it's worth referring to that. Speech problems might be due to structural changes. Um, it might be in the mouth, such as cleft palate or tongue tie. It might be due to not being able to hear the sounds properly. It might be that the child hasn't organised the sounds in their language system, and we call that a phonological delay. And it makes the child sound like their speech is that of a younger child. It might be that that dis is disordered, so they're not making the normal patterns errors of an, a younger child, they're making unusual errors and we'll usually see them for speech therapy. Dummy sucking can cause real issues as well um, because it affects the way the child's pronouncing words. They might have a difficulty such as verbal dyspraxia that affects their speech or disfluency or stammering might impact how they sound too. So the strategies for speech are quite similar to language. You've got to be that good model. You've got to provide lots of talking opportunities and reducing that background noise so children can focus on listening on how the speech is, is pronounced. And um, certainly if you're with younger ones, um, removing dummies and bottles by one year because that's when the speech sounds really start to develop. Try not to correct speech, but model it back so that they have that good model for you from you. But with an older child, you can prompt them if they're able to correct themselves. Lots of this the, of speech games um, that you can do to support speech, certainly for those younger children. Um, and if you're using letters and sounds and, and you're doing phonics teaching that early phases of letters and sounds, all these kind of activities that are in that will be really appropriate to support children's speech development. So we talked about how language oracy supports literacy. So I'm just going to hand over to, to Sarah again to just take us through these last few slides. I hope that's OK, Francesca. I know we're a bit a bit over on time. Just got the last couple of slides, so um, thank you. Um, the, and the, and a few of the last slides are inform, information slides. So um, yeah, we, it's already mentioned about how important um, an oral language is before we are expected to develop those reading and writing skills. So um, there's a lot more to reading than just phonics. 
you know, not being more than in decoding and just kind of segmenting and blending. Um, it's actually understanding what you're reading, because otherwise it's kind of if you don't understand what you're reading, you're just kind of saying lots of non words. Um, so that it's really important to kind of remember that distinction. Um, Sharing stories is a great way to kind of promote positive kind of associations with books. It's certainly as well um, to provide opportunities in those early days um, for interaction and, and kind of throughout really uh, interaction throughout, throughout childhood. Um, shared attention, so you're looking at one thing and focusing and it certainly helps to kind of um, be, um, expose children to rich vocabularies where you can explain words, any new words that kind of crop up. Um, enjoying the book sharing from birth really helps to develop that love of reading, which is really important to developing confident readers. Um, there is a really strong link um, from the National Literacy Trust report that um, the link between reading for pleasure and attainment in literacy scores um, and the increase in the writing ability, grammar, breadth of vocabulary, general knowledge and reading for pleasure in later life. Um, and that's all kind of related to that frequency of reading. The next slide looks at that useful resources. So um, we mentioned about the ICANN information that you'll be able to find in our Stoke Speaks Out checklist um, tools as well. Um, there is also a BBC Tiny Happy People, um, a really strong, you, um, especially those of you in early years, a really strong um, urge you to look at um, that. Um, so um, there's some fabulous activities, videos, information around what um, directing parents to what they can do with their child, lots of science behind why, you know, kind of babies love facial expressions or nursery rhymes. Um, so really informative. So um, again, you'll be able to find that on the slides. You see Tiny Happy People is kind of mainly aged at kind of sort of from birth to five um, to five years, but I can obviously have got some other things as well. Um, Communication is a right, it's everyone's business. Uh, we say it so it speaks out. So involving lots of other professionals in your, in to support you. So um, whether that be health visitors, pediatricians, social workers and school nurses to share all these really important messages about how important communication is and to support you as well. Um, children's centres and community groups can really help with signposting parents to the, that um, really kind of um, language rich um, and positive role models um, in those groups. Um, library sessions as well, really strongly um, to, to find post parents to that. Um, our early years child development tool on Stoke Speaks Out um, or stokespeaks.org website. Um, speech and language therapy, obviously kind of um, as a given that we will support with children with SLCN. Please check about the referral pathway in your area and um, to kind of the process in what in what's happened and obviously access early years teams and specialist support and um, send support um, as you would need to. Just the last couple of slides and um, so the key messages are that speech and language difficulties are the most common developmental difficulty you will find so typically 10% of the population so at least three children in your classroom will have some speech and language difficulty. Early identification is crucial to supporting um, kind of um, and kind of avoiding um, kind of any difficulties in the future and supporting life kind of chances. The solutions are often very simple and just tweaking and adjusting um, and in everyday activities. Um, if these are not enough, then timely referral for support is essential um, and left unsupported um, SLCN can lead to wide um, a range of poor outcomes for children and young people. So we'll take any questions, but that is it. Further information on the websites that I've mentioned already. Um, so Hungry Little Minds is a National Literacy Trust campaign um, that you'll be able to find some information on there. And I thank Sarah and Victoria. I don't think, unfortunately, that we're going to have time for questions. Okay. But we can certainly pick up some questions during the next two sessions yeah. on the 30th of November and the 9th of December. Of and I thank you both because what you've given us is the background to the theory of what's going on in our classrooms, but then also lots of really, really practical advice and places to go to for information. So thank you. And we're looking forward to the 30th of November. Oh, thank you're you very welcome. much. And thank, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you everybody for attending. Thank you. Thank you.